Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Novec Talk. My name is Paulius. I am the Managing Director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. And we are very happy to welcome you to the 35th Novec Talk. Um, today's agenda will be very similar to previous occasions. There is a five minute welcome that I always give. Then we will have our Novec Early Career Researcher for today, Raquel Lorenzo Vidal from Pompeo Fabra University and the Barcelona School of Economics with a pre recorded uh, video as usual. Then we will have uh, 45 minutes of the main speaker for today, Dr. Erin Krupka from the University of Michigan. And finally, 15 minutes of Q&A. A uh, brief reminder, as I always do, that the Novec Talks speaker series is organized by our Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania with uh, the support of the PP program and the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences um, support. Uh, the Penn Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics is a research center at the university that works on consulting research and training services with uh, all types of, of organizations all over the world. You can see more information uh, in our website. We have a working paper series, we have all the, our research, we have a new blog, we have lots of things um, for you to see. If you scan this QR code, you can also follow us on Twitter, where we publish our news regularly as well. Um, in terms of the Novec talks, as you probably know, this is the last talk of our um, of, of this group of, of talks. We will announce soon a new speaker lineup that will begin in September and will continue until the end of the year and then uh, next year as well. Uh, in this uh, link in our website, or if you scan the QR code, you can see the Novec Talks uh, website and see all the videos of our uh, 34, uh, 35 with today uh, talks that we've done and also uh, 34 uh, early career researchers as well. Um, also, a small reminder that uh, we are holding our in-person conference uh, again this uh, fall here at the University of Pennsylvania. It will be a two-day in-person event with uh, Michelle Gelfand and Leonardo Burstein as keynotes. We will also have a free conference event about norms in the developing world uh, the day before. Um, we already closed our call for papers and posters. We, we uh, received a lot of applications and we are reviewing them now. And we'll confirm the final agenda and open the registrations um, in August. You can see more information at novetconference.com. And then if this is the first time that you're joining a few ground rules, um, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, if you want, if you can, please keep your camera on so that we have a more interactive experience. For questions, you can use the chat during the talk. Um, there is a code with us in the, in the audience that will be um, answering some of your questions and discussing there. Uh, or you can use the raise hand function uh, at the end in the Q&A slot. And uh, as I already mentioned, the recording of these sessions and all our sessions uh, are uploaded in our website. So with that, I would like to um, present our Novec Early Career Researcher for today. Raquel Lorenzo Vidal is a PhD candidate at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra and a pre-doctoral researcher at the Barcelona School of Economics. Um, Raquel, if you are in the audience, could you please briefly introduce yourself? Hi, uh, hi everyone. Yeah, thanks Paulius and thanks to the center for having me. So yeah, as you said, I'm a PhD student at UBF. My research interests are mostly 
um, economic theory, game theory, and information economics. And the video that you are going to see today is basically summarizing my first uh, project, uh, which is about social norms and how they can sustain in time uh, and when. And I'm going to share my email in the chat. So please feel free to send me any suggestion, questions, or comments that you have. I'm sure they are going to be extremely helpful for me. So thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for joining us and for submitting your video. So I will share the video now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. So today I'm presenting my work on social preferences and norms. So basically, the question that I'm trying to answer is what social norms can sustain if agents have social preferences and they interact over time? So to answer this question, I propose a theoretical model where we have an infinite society of agents who have personal morals that they want to follow and social preferences. Namely, they want to follow or match others' behavior and they want to match the morals of others. So what others think should be done. The interaction is a static game. First, nature assigns a moral to each agent. Then agents learn their own moral and simultaneously choose an action. Finally, they obtain their payoffs that are going to depend on the action, their moral, the actions of others, and the morals of others. This allows me to have agents that in stage one are going to make choices that depend on their empirical expectations and normative expectations. Now, the equilibrium concept that I use is called self-confirming equilibrium. And what it's saying basically is that in equilibrium, agents that agents best respond to their beliefs about the distribution of actions and to their beliefs about the distribution of models. Moreover, I require that behavior is correctly forecasted, so agents have correct empirical expectations in equilibrium. However, others' models might be misperceived, so they may hold wrong normative expectations. Then to put together or to reconcile the empirical and normative expectations, agents hold conjectures that are basically beliefs about how others best respond to their moral, to their intrinsic preferences and social preferences. So different pairs of beliefs about the distribution of morals and conjectures about how people respond to their morals and beliefs can explain different distributions of actions. And the goal of the analysis is understanding the set of equilibrium outcomes, which is basically, you know, from my understanding, the set of norms that can sustain in time. So sometimes we will have that agents can disentangle others' morals from their actions, and in this case, the equilibrium outcome will be unique. So we will have a unique collective behavior or a unique social norm that sustains in time. Sometimes even small misperceptions of other best responses, so small mistakes in the conjectures, will lead to a wrong understanding of the distribution of morals by agents and ultimately lead to multiple equilibrium outcomes. So we will have that multiple social norms could sustain in time. This multiplicity arises due to wrong beliefs and small mistakes in the conjectures, but not due to coordination problems or signaling motives as in previous literature. So I'm shutting down these channels and showing how multiplicity of social norms arises only due to the wrong beliefs. So let's go briefly to the results. The first proposition is saying that if agents want to follow their own morals and are subject to social influence only through the actions of others, the equilibrium outcome is unique. So this is equivalent to saying that we have a unique descriptive norm that can sustain over time. Proposition two is saying that if agents hold correct conjectures, so they understand very well how others respond to their morals, and they are subject to some sort of social influence, so apart from caring about matching or following their own moral, they care about matching either the actions, the morals, or both uh, of others, um, then the set of equilibrium outcomes is also unique. So we will have a unique social norm. Importantly, this is the efficient social norm or the efficient collective behavior. Um, this is what Proposition 3 is saying. And well, this is not surprising because as expected, the equilibrium with correct conjectures that lead to correct beliefs um, in equilibrium 
is the more is more efficient than other type of equilibria that are sustained by wrong beliefs. And let's see now whether this type of equilibria sustained by wrong beliefs exists. Proposition four is saying yes, it does, and it exists whenever people care about others' morals, no matter whether they also care about others' actions or not. Um, and when others may not be well understood, so when we allow for conjectures to be incorrect. And this set of equilibrium outcomes or set of norms that can sustain in time always includes the efficient uh, social norm that is the one that is sustained by correct conjectures and beliefs. So to sum up, a distribution of actions can be explained by different pairs of beliefs and conjectures. And when social influence is only through actions, this is an important for behavior. So there will be a unique descriptive norm. However, when social influence is also through morals, different beliefs might lead to different behaviors. And there will be multiple social norms sustained in time. Importantly, equilibria other than the efficient one are sustained by some degree of misperception of others' best responses. That's it. Thanks for listening. Comments are very welcome. Feel free to email me in this email address. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Raquel, for the great presentation. Um, as in previous occasions for the early career researcher uh, slot, unfortunately, we don't have time for live questions, but um, please feel free to post any questions and comments in the chat. Um, and you can discuss there with Raquel. And with that, uh, I am happy to introduce uh, our main speaker for today, uh, Dr. Erin Krupka. He is an associate professor of information and the director of the doctoral program at the School of Information of the University of Michigan. She's an experimental behavioral economist who explores the ways in which social incentives and environmental factors influence behavior using both laboratory and field experiments. And before joining the School of Information as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Krupka graduated from Carnegie Mellon University and joined ISA in Bonn, Germany as a positive. Um, the, call, the talk for today is called Determinants of Non-Compliance, Moral Similarity and Group Identification. Um, the moderator <clears throat> is Dr. Oigon Demand, an associate professor of practice in behavior and decision sciences and a core member of our center. Um, and as mentioned before, we have a, a co-author in the audience. So please feel free to post your questions and comments in the chat during the talk. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Kruka, for joining us. And feel free to share your screen. OK, thank you. Let me uh, do that here. All right, I think you can see uh, my title slide. If not, let me know. Um, so I wanted to actually start. So my co-author, Alexander uh, Schneeberger, Alex is in, in the audience. And um, I also wanted to start by just uh, reflecting for a moment before you guys all arrive. Uh, we were sitting here chatting that it's been, um, for me anyway, 20 years almost since um, I had the first pleasure of getting to know Christina as a doctoral student. And it was my luck, really. Um, I started at Carnegie Mellon in the Decision Sciences Group, and um, there was this course in the philosophy department, and I was on norms, and I took it, and it was Christina and three other people, and we chit-chatted about her book. Uh, that then uh, became the Grammar of Society. It was a groundbreaking book um, for many people uh, in economics, philosophy, psychology, um, across disciplines. But for me personally, it was um, also absolutely transformative, uh, the experience of working with her and um, learning about norms. The other thing, which of course will come as no surprise, was um, that uh, the energy, the sheer force that Christina brought to um, the enthusiasm of our reading group, and of course uh, sustained over 20 years. And so it's it's with quite, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure um, 
for me anyway, from going from a small reading group of four people who thought, you know, norms were really interesting and this crusader in Christina uh, to a situation where we have this incredible group at Nobeck um, and, um, you know, interest across multiple disciplines. Um, I, I just think it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing to witness. And, um, and so not only am I deeply excited to be here, but it's also a really big arc. Um, <laughs> and um, just, just thought I'd reflect on that for a moment. Um, I think Tatiana was 10 or something crazy. I mean, <laughs> it's just insane. <laughs> so, all right. So the talk today is on uh, determinants of norm compliance, moral similarity, and group identification. So let me uh, begin here. Oh, let's see here. Let me get the slides going. All right. So, um, you know, we work and live in groups, and this is uh, ubiquitous. In fact, if you're uh, teaching in um, today's environment at the graduate level, then you're also usually incorporating teamwork. Why? Because everybody needs to know how to work in groups, because that's how we work now. Um, and, um, you know, so the case for why group uh, group behavior is so important, I think, I hope is, is uh, pretty evident. Um, but there are poor, a few important points to make here. One, um, we don't just work and live in these groups. We often define ourselves as part a part of ourselves through our group membership. You know, I'm I'm a member of the University of Michigan, or I'm a member of the Nobeck group. Um, our membership often requires us to follow uh, rules. Some rules are explicit, some are informal, and our group uh, memberships. Some group memberships matter more to us than others. So I am in the cat and dog owners uh, groups, but they aren't as important to me as uh, say being part of the uh, Nobeck group and being a mother and being a professor. Um, the way uh, in uh, the way that this has been one way that people have talked about this is uh, through a theory that was actually come come out of a psychology called social identity theory. Uh, it was you know developed um, or articulated most prominently in the mid seventies, late seventies, and has since sustained a long and interesting um, line of research, both in psychology and then sort of crossing over in the two thousands with Akerlof and Cranton's work and and then the subsequent work. And so we can think of social identity as those aspects in particular of our identity that are defined through our membership in groups. Um, and uh, so the, the identity theory itself uh, models key aspects of behavior uh, by situating motivation for action in our group membership. Um, and for, you know, for economists anyway, this, these, um, this has offered a really important insight into behaviors that we can't fully explain with what I'll call standard um, or old, you know, neoclassical economic theories, where an individual's preferences are fixed and utility depends on some type of pecuniary or outcome variable. Um, so, um, you know, in econ, the way we've uh, thought about this since, you know, to these uh, transformative papers in the 2000s is that, you know, utility comes directly from our membership. Um, and this is, of course, grounded in the original theories where um, identity membership uh, created esteem. Um, and uh, gains in utility then come from complying with or uh, disutility from violating group specific norms. So, uh, so that's the framework we're going to adopt here too, is this identity framework. Um, so the norms piece is really important in this, in this model because um, there are these group specific norms then that drive behavior. So I'm a member of multiple groups. I define myself as pieces of myself um, uh, critically through my membership, and I care to comply with the expectations, the normative expectations of those groups. Um, and each group might have a different norm, even for the same situation. What a mother would do versus a professor would do when a distraught student comes into the office is different, right? Um, and so uh, these group-specific social norms are, uh, we all define them as joint, i.e. group-specific agreement. It's not maybe, it's that I acknowledge and I know. I don't need to necessarily think they're the best. I just need to acknowledge and know uh, that there is uh, an appropriate or inappropriate action that can be taken in a particular situation. And I put a few papers up here um, in particular um, that touch on this, but I, I want to highlight um, Burke's, uh, Steve Burke's paper, but also because Steve's in the audience, but you're going to see me come back to this um, paper, which we wrote uh, in 2012, where we uh, looked at uh, employers and their, um, and, uh, and their employees. So think of this as a hierarchical environment. There are bosses and, and employees. And what we showed was that um, employees uh, have certain uh, beliefs and norms about how they get things done. 
And uh, they are aware of management's desires for what those norms are, for how they should get things done. Um, and in some cases, uh, they, their norms are actually different from the norms the managers hoped they would adopt. And you'll see me come back to this um, result a little bit later um, when I motivate um, further what we're doing here. But the idea here that there are group specific social norms and that I occupy multiple groups is important. So, um, you know, lots of empirical studies um, have, and mine included, identified the average effect of the social identity on behavior. But theory and some evidence shows that there's heterogeneity. And of course, intuition tells us there's heterogeneity in how much a particular social identity might impact behavior. Said differently, you know, among our multiple social identities, we may be more sensitive to some identity norms and less sensitive to other identity norms. Um, and so in econ, in the models anyway, um, that's expressed as a weight in the utility function that modulates the degree to which identity norms then impact choice. Okay. Uh, so, and one of the things that sort of we're, we're adding here, it's not, um, it's not to say others haven't made this point, but I want to highlight here is that group identification, the degree to which I say this group really matters to me, um, could be a source of the norm sensitivity, a variation in that sensitivity. So we're going to define group identification as um, a group that is enduringly salient as um, the basis for self-definition. So uh, that, that's going to be how we're going to think about it. And it's in social psychology, again, going back to this, you know, really interesting and important work in this area, um, in social psychology, the self-categorization theory argues that the group identification leads to norm compliance. So sort of giving us this clue that identification could in fact affect behavior through group norm sensitivity. And there's also empirical evidence consistent with this. Catherine's work, for example, uh, and, and several other uh, papers in this space showing that, uh, that uh, this identification really matters. Now, I want to just come back to this paper that Steve and I wrote, um, where we showed um, that, the, remember, these workers and their, their bosses. So these workers, um, they were able to identify what their bosses wanted their norms to be, and they were able to identify what their group norms were. But when we asked these same employees, what do you personally think? So no incentive, just asking them, hey, what do you think about what you should do in this situation? In those cases where they perceive themselves as different from the group, so they both were able to say, I know what the group's norms are, but mine are different. Either I think I'm more lenient or I'm more strict, I take things more seriously, whichever direction it went, that didn't matter. But when they knew they were different, this was correlated with the intentions to leave the organization and an increased likelihood in subsequent incentivized experiments that we did to harm other coworkers. So we see, um, you know, very, uh, for me, this paper is really, uh, really, um, um, really fascinating, a uh, prescient, if you will, to, to the, the paper that Alex and I are working on. You can see that the value alignment between myself and my group um, really matters in important ways for how, uh, how much I, um, for my behavior and how much I care about, uh, about the group. So we're going to uh, kind of set that up or use it as an intuition for what we're about to do here. Okay, so group identification, um, interestingly though, has also been shown to affect the norm directly. So on the one hand, we've got group identification affecting how much I care about a norm, but on the other hand, we have another body of literature that shows that the group identification can itself um, impact the norm, I, the very norm itself. Um, and, and here, you know, Eugene's most recent work, um, I think, is also actually I meant to put the 2021, the revised version of the paper, but um, your your Trump paper there, I think, is, is part of, of showing that. Um, so we've got two possible channels for group identification to influence behavior, one through norm sensitivity and the other through the norms themselves. So in this paper, what we're going to do is we're going to ask whether increased identification can uh, increase net norm sensitivity. And we're gonna ask whether increased similarity increases identification. So we're gonna look at the mechanism. Um, the broad contributions that we see are establishing this causal mechanism from identification to group norm sensitivity and showing that identification can be increased through the alignment of values. 
So the theoretical framework they're going to use for this is one, you know, uh, again, uh, early work of Christina's as well, showing uh, sort of establishing this framework um, that uh, utility uh, of individual I from selecting an action is going to come from the degree to which the individual cares about adhering to norms of the social group, the identification with the group, um, the value alignment, and the norm itself. Let me let me break each of these ideas down a little bit more. So what we're I'm going to go backwards now. So what I'm saying is that the identification, okay, the degree to which I identify with the social identity um, or with the norms uh, that I'm going to comply with is going to be a function of my value, my perceived value alignment. How much do I see myself as similar to holding similar values to those around me, okay, or to the group around me? Then what, oh, sorry, then what we're saying is that identification then in turn affects the weight that I place on complying with the group norm, that particular group norm. And finally, we're going to say that the group norm is exogenous. That is, an individual doesn't, you know, in any given instance, change the norm. That's given. Um, and it's a function that we're going to describe it, at least, as a function that maps approval, uh, uh, social approval and perception of appropriateness to actions. So the question is, how are we going to manipulate identification? So to influence our group identification, we're going to vary the moral similarity between our participants and the group from which they're going to learn about the norms. In order to do this, we're going to use moral foundations theory, um, most uh, recently um, talked about uh, in the book by uh, Jonathan Haidt to conceptualize morality. The moral similarity in moral foundations theory has been shown and used in other work um, to influence preferences and behavior. And, and our work is, um, I would say, most uh, closely uh, inspired by the work of Enke uh, in particular. This uh, foundations theory says that actually there's no one moral. There is actually a set of values um, that give rise to a moral orientation. And that set of values can be um, divided up into these five broad categories, individualizing values, harm and fairness, and also binding values, my views on authority, my views about how one ought to treat the in-group, and my views about purity behaviors like washing hands and things like that. Each of these five pillars then give rise to some kind of morality. Um, uh, and again, thinking about morality now as multi-dimensional. Um, so we're gonna use a survey uh, that uh, they developed to classify people as uh, having a very, uh, as and position them as having a different, um, uh, being in a different place on a grid around uh, these moral values. The main hypotheses that we're going to explore and test are that an increased group identification will be associated with increased norm sensitivity. We're also going to test that increased similarity, moral similarity in particular, increases group identification. Now, what we're going to do, though, is we're also going to test these ancillary hypotheses. That is, we're going to hold the norm constant. We're assuming that uh, that the channel, we want to look at the, the increased sensitivity coming from identification. And in order to do that, we've got to hold this other channel constant, which is the norm itself that can't be changing between the groups. So all the, all the groups that we're going to look at, the two groups, they have to have the same norm so that we can identify and say, well, what's happening here is coming through this other channel, which is is uh, the norm sensitivity. And then um, the ancillary hypotheses associated with this first one, uh, with the second one around a similarity are that we're going to test that indeed sharing moral, similar moral values does increase group identification. Now, one thing that's worth noting here is, um, and, you know, happy to chat afterwards, because um, I think it's an interesting sort of bigger footnote is um, a lot of the procedural work in experimental uh, economics anyway around generating um, similarity amongst groups. So creating groups, groupiness, if you will, um, has been focused in the lab at any rate. Um, if we're using uh, if, if we're creating those identities in the lab, then we're going to use the Clay Kandinsky protocol. Most of you, if you're familiar with it, are, are uh, familiar with it through um, 
uh, probably Yan Chen's work in that space. Um, and there what you have is a case where I'm grouped and I'm placed with people and I'm told I'm similar to them on something that's orthogonal to all of their social preferences, for example, right? Whether I like clay or Kandinsky paintings, probably not related to whether or not I'm a nice person and give to charities. Um, and so you have this procedure where you're creating um, groups and creating uh, similarity through liking of something, uh, in this case, Clay Kanitsky pictures that's orthogonal to um, things that you're being that are being tested in the in the experiment. Um, the other basic approach is to use um, existing identities. So for instance, um, my uh, if you're looking at Rachel Cranton, she used um, Democrats and Republicans. So you bring these identities with you into the lab. Here, we're doing something that's a little bit different. And um, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting methodological uh, contribution that for this group might be interesting. So I'm highlighting it here, which is we're gonna use a value orientation and group people on values based on similarity and values, which arguably they do bring with them into the lab. Um, and uh, and uh, I think the reason this is interesting is one, um, it's something that we might find useful in management as I situated this earlier in, in a labor or management context. Um, and it's probably more naturally occurring than uh, uh, something like a Clay Kandinsky preference. And it may be actually fundamental to our political alignment as well. So it may be a, a bent rock to some of these other identities that we tend to explore when we use imported or, or existing identities. So small footnote, happy to return to that. Um, so those are our two main hypotheses in the sets of ancillary hypotheses. So I'm, I'm gonna go into the design now. Um, so here we've got, uh, the overview of the experiments, and I'm going to break each piece down. Um, the results are really simple once we understand the design. Um, so uh, we've got this pre-screening service. Let me talk about this guy first. What are we doing here? We're going to create a subject pool where we know the moral position of each subject. In order to understand the moral position, which we're going to treat as this multi-dimensional object, that's why we're going to call it a position, um, subjects answer the moral foundations questionnaire. It's 30 questions, and there's six questions for each of the dimensions, harm, fairness, in-group, authority, and purity. Um, here you can see the scale and how we, um, and the types of questions we use, and you can sort of get a sense of the interface um, that, we, uh, that we used as well. So um, we coded the we coded then the moral position as following. We took the average score to people's responses on the six questions of harm and six questions of fairness to get the individualizing score, and we took the average on each of the six individual of each of the six uh, uh, questions for in-group authority and purity and averaged those to get the binding score. From that, we took the difference the individualizing minus the binding score to get what we're gonna call a progressivism index. That index ranges from negative five to positive five. If you think about what's on the negative side, those are people whose orientation, whose moral orientation is towards more what we might call binding. And on the positive side, those people are people who have a moral orientation that's more towards individualizing. So the higher the number, the more of an individualizing type you are. The lower the number, the more of a binding type you are. Okay, then from that, we took 10 people who were individualizing. Now we have our subject pool and we know something important about them, namely where they are on this moral foundations uh, grid. And we took 10 people who were individualizing and 10 people who were binding and invited them to our rule elicitation survey. In the rule elicitation survey, um, we introduced participants to uh, Kimbrough and Vostratnikov's 2018 uh, rule following task. And we described this task to them. So I'll tell you what the task is. And then we asked them to tell us what the rule is. So the rule following task asks people to put uh, to follow an arbitrary rule at some cost to themselves. In this case, the rule is to place all the balls in the blue bucket. But you can see that by placing all the balls in the blue bucket, their payoffs can be five pennies in this case, or five pence, versus uh, if they ignore the rule and place all the balls in the yellow bucket, then they'll get more money. So that model sort of the trade-off of following this rule, which has absolutely no other 
reason, uh, except that we told you to, um, and uh, but you're going to have a cost by doing it. So we describe this situation to them, and um, then uh, we uh, and we explain to them exactly what's going on, uh, just like I did to you, and then we tell them that the rule is to put the balls into the blue bucket, okay. And then we ask the participants to describe the rule. Is the rule to put the balls in the blue bucket or the rule to put the balls in the yellow bucket? Now, at this point, you're scratching your head. You're saying, why did they do this? <laughs> Let me tell you why we did this. What do we get from doing this? So in subsequent experiments, we're going to sort participants who answered these questions on based on their progressive in, index. In particular, we're going to have some people who were individualizers who told us the rule was to put the balls in the blue bucket. We're going to have some people who are binding, who are more binding, morally uh, oriented in a binding way, who told us the rule was to put it in a blue bucket. So thus, we have the same statement, the rule, which describe which we can describe to other subjects as coming from groups with different moral positions. Now, why this is important is that it allows us to report statements about the rule to other subjects in our subsequent treatments so we don't use deception. So that's why we did that. Okay, so now having gotten that information, we're on to our main design, which is the choice experiment. And there we had 320 people, but we only used individualizing uh, subjects here. We could have used all kinds, but um, this was... Um, uh, but uh, but uh, but in this case, all we need is uh, to have one group feel more close and one group feel distant uh, from the people who are telling them what the rule is. So we only use the individualizing here, but we could do it with you know the uh, the binding folks as well. Okay, so only individualizers are in this uh, choice experiment, and they're randomized to either the individualizing treatment or the binding treatment. The first thing that happens in this uh, experiment is that they're introduced to the individualizing group or the binding group. So these are individualizing subjects, and they're either introduced to people who are like them or people who are not like them. So let's tell you a little bit about how we introduce them. They're shown five responses, which were the average rating by members from a group we call group A. And uh, I'm only showing you two of them here, but they saw all of them. And they're told um, what the question and response was to each of the five dimensions of morality that I told you before about. Now, um, what's important to understand here is that, remember, if I'm in this experiment, I am myself an individualizing subject. If I'm in the individualizing treatment, then I'm seeing people who answered these questions for instance, whether or not someone cared for someone weak or vulnerable, they answered these questions in a way that was probably similar to how I think about them. So what I see as a subject, if I'm an, a reading and I'm in the individualizing treatment, what I see as a subject is that I see someone else's responses or the average response, and I see that they said that this was a very relevant feature for them. Okay, this was something they really cared about. Whoever answered this question really cared about this. Whoever answered this question said this was very relevant to them. Whoever answered this question said slightly relevant. Okay, so if I'm an individualizing subject and I learn about group A and group A's response is coming from other individualizers, then this is what the responses looked like that I read about. And likely, I am probably thinking and feeling the same about these answers. However, if I am a subject, I'm an individualizer, but I'm in the binding treatment and I'm introduced to the binding group responses, then I read these, I get these answers over here. I learned that they said whether or not someone cared for someone weak or vulnerable was only somewhat relevant to them. And so I feel likely possibly, as I read these, that they're different from me. So we asked people, the folks in our, in, our, in our choice experiment, to read the answers and to memorize the responses, try and remember them, okay? And then subsequently, we asked them to recall one randomly chosen answer, and we paid them an incentive for being correct in remembering how people of group A probably answered these questions. They weren't told whether they got it right till the end. 
But the point was we wanted them to pay attention to who these people were that we were telling, telling them about, this new group A. Now, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? So this there here, a picture might, might help uh, explain this a little better. So we're telling people in our experiment about group A. And we're either telling them that group A's morals lean by our design to be more individualizing, more like you, or we're telling them about people in group A and we're telling them by virtue of showing them group A's average responses that these people are not very like you. Subjects who are randomized to learn about either group A or the, this type of group A or this type of group A um, are, um, are, are then either more or less similar to the group they're learning about. All of our subjects by virtue of being individualizers are above this 45 degree line because that's who we selected into this experiment. Um, and so what that means is that they're randomized to be more similar to the group they're learning about or they're randomized to be less similar to the group they're learning about, okay? All right, let me just make sure that's clear because this is a really important part. Okay, I see some people going, I got it. Okay, so once you've learned about the group, uh, then we're going to ask you, how similar do you feel to this group? So here we're gonna use an inclusion of group to the self scale. And uh, the task was, in, was unincentivized. This is just saying, here's you, and here's the group A you just learned about. Tell us how similar you are. Think of this as a manipulation check. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna measure their compliance with the rule. So we then tell them that some parts of the instructions were selected by the members of the group that you just learned about. We didn't communicate a general rule to them, but instead we used the individualizing or binding rule statement from the rule elicitation survey to say what the rule was. So remember, in each case, you're going to get the same, it doesn't matter which treatment you, you're in, you're gonna to be told people from group A said the rule was put the ball in blue bucket, except now you're either, in a, you're either receiving that from group A whom you feel more similar to, or you're receiving it from a group A you don't feel very similar to. Okay, so that's, that's the sum total, that's the choice experiment. That's uh, what we're interested in is looking at uh, what they do in this environment. And then we, uh, we also uh, took, again, 200 individualizing subjects from our subject pool, and uh, they the, instead participated in a normal elicitation experiment. So either people participated here or here or here. No one participated in both or three. All right, so in the norm experiment, we then randomized people either 100 to the binding treatment, 100 to the individualizing treatment. We introduced them to the group, just like we did in the choice experiment. This is identical to the choice experiment, except now we measured the norm to follow the rule. Now, this is important. Remember, I told you we want to lock down one channel. We don't want people to tell us, wow, you know, you don't need to follow a rule if it comes from these schmucks over there. We want them, we want to know, or at least test, do they think you should still follow the rule? Okay. So this is how we're going to figure out or hold down and lock down this other channel, which is that the norm to comply with the rule changed, okay, or didn't. So in order to do this normal elicitation, we inform subjects that they have to evaluate the potential behavior of participants in another study. And they then learn about the rule following task and that other subjects have been told about the rule by subjects from group A. And depending on which treatment they're in, they're, we're telling them group A was uh, answer questions this way, or group A answered the questions this way. And then they had to rate how socially appropriate it is to place uh, no balls, some balls, or all the balls in the blue rule compliant bucket. They're going to play a coordination game and match ratings to another participant. And so what they're matching here is they're picking whether this action, for example, put zero balls in the blue bucket and all 20 in the yellow bucket is very socially inappropriate or somewhat or very socially appropriate. 
And so, you know, in an uh, earlier paper, Roberto Weber and I showed that the norms here uh, for rule following, for example, are going to create focal points in the game. So we can use their responses in these games to create an empirical proxy of that norm function that I showed you earlier on in the, in the theoretical model. Okay. After the experiment and in each treatment, we randomly select a rating and then calculate the modal rating. If the participants pick the same answer, they receive two pounds for it. Okay, so our experiment, so that's the design. And our experiments were conducted on prolific and pre-registered. Um, let me pause there. Any, any concerns or questions? I know just to make sure we got everything in the chat, everybody's going. All right. Okay. No questions. No questions. Good. You good, got good. It. Okay, hypotheses and results. Um, because all like the, all the heavy work is in the understanding of the design. Then the, the results just kind of flow from there in this case. Um, there's nothing too fancy in the results section. Okay, so ancillary. First, we're gonna just sort of make sure there's no difference in the group norms, right? Um, we're gonna say, look, it doesn't matter whether group A was people who are individualizers or group A was people who were binding. Um, all individualizers who played our norms games uh and learned about the rule, whether it came from an individualizing group or a binding group, told us you should put the balls in the blue bucket. <laughs> There's no difference in the norms. Um, and that's good because that we want to lock down that channel. Um, another ancillary hypothesis that we had is um, sort of the functional form of the norm. Um, and what we show here is just that that's increasing linearly with the number of balls that are uh, in the rule compliant bucket. So each, so think of this as each additional ball that you place in the rule compliant bucket, your uh, is is more and more appropriate. Okay. Now, um, group identification is higher for individualizing subjects who were assigned to receive the rule from the individualizing group. This is our, if you think of this as a manipulation check. And so what we get is that on average, group identification responses are significantly higher in the individualizing treatment. That is, they tell us, I do feel more similar <laughs> to group A when A are individualizers. Um, uh, now, our, one of our main hypotheses is that the number of balls in the rule compliant bucket will be higher in the individualizing treatment. Okay. And indeed, so here what we find is that in the, um, we have to, I'm going to get to this, this little ancillary in a second, controlling for the authority question. So when we control for the, when we exclude observations who are in the, who received the authority control question, what we observe is that in the individualizing treatment, they place 8.24 balls in the blue bucket. That is, they're told the rule is put the balls in the blue bucket, and they put more balls in the blue bucket than they do in the binding treatment, where they only put six and a half in roughly. Now, when we use all observations, that includes the authority control question, which I'll get to in a minute to remind you what, what's going on there, we find that that difference is not significant. So let me say what, what's going on here. This authority control question, um, Remember, we asked subjects to remember how people from group A responded to various questions. And then we said, we're going to incentivize you to remember by paying you if you can remember um, how they answered one randomly drawn question. In the case where that randomly drawn question where we basically uh, ask them how did your how did group A likely respond to this? When the question was related to authority, it ended up uh, um, it ended up uh, priming, if or at least this is our interpretation, some type of um, unintentionally some type of behavior, uh, such that when we exclude this prime, at least this is our interpretation, that result that we have comes through. So I'll just add that we're rerunning these treatments now um, to try and understand and, and control better for the authority question, um, the authority control question. It wasn't something we anticipated going into the uh, study, kind of caught us off guard. Um, okay. So our next main hypothesis is that uh, higher group identification increases norm sensitivity. 
So here you're seeing a, a Tobit specification, and what you're find, what you're seeing here is the identification now uh, de described or captured as the distance. So remember those two sliding uh, self and uh, group. You could slide them around to try and see um, to to demonstrate or give us a sense of how close, how aligned you felt with the group. And uh, what we're showing is that the that the closer those things are, the closer those two circles are that you move, the higher it is, uh, the more balls you put in the blue bucket. So we see that identification, at least self, uh, this is unincentivized, this um, response format, but that a self-described higher identification does increase norm sensitivity here, because norm hasn't changed, only my compliance with it. Now, one thing we can also do is we can look at the comparison with um, others in the literature. And here uh, we use Chen and Lee's um, paper, 2009 AR, and they had this really interesting result where when they dropped, so they did variations and included sort of if you chat, if you do um, Clay Kandinsky, if you have uh, then add chat, uh, et cetera. And what they found was that um, the difference between having the ability to chat beforehand about something unrelated to the task uh, and then going into the task, having that ability increased uh, identification, um, or think of it this way, removing the chat decreased identification by about point, uh, negative 0.13 on a scale normalized here for comparison. And when we look at our results, what we're finding is a similar effect size, which is a drop of about 0.14 in at the, when we evaluate at the mean, the progressivism measure. So again, some nice consistency across studies here. Okay. So that um, brings me to uh, to the end. And as I said, it's a very simple paper. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm butting up against time, but I did want to leave some time to chat about uh, various things that I didn't unpack particularly. So let me open it up here. Great, Aaron. Thanks so much. <clears throat> so um, we do have some questions. Maybe if you want to just leave up the slides. Um, in okay. case uh, People just want to go back on the slides. Um, let me maybe start with a question that Alex um, provided some intuition on. Maybe you have some intuition yourself. Are you able to uh, see the slides? Yes, yes, okay. looks great. So, so I was personally surprised if you go back a couple slides where you show the means for the overlapping circles and you show it's like 0.8 for the in-group and 0.62 yeah. for the out-group. Um, so personally, I was surprised a little bit by how high it is for the out-group for the binding treatment. 0.62 seems high. Right. So do you have any intuition as to why that is? I would have expected maybe more difference, although it's significant, right? But it yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. The numbers. Um, Alex, do you want to try and take that one? Um, yes, my intuition would be that um, we use simply groups that don't have any um, previous interactions with the participants. And um, that therefore there is not um, a past of a tilt hostility that might have emerged. And the other thing um, that I've also written in the chat was that um, um, when we created those two groups, individualizing participants and the binding participants, that we used the average position of those, um, we could have also used only the 10 percentile of most binding individuals. And then we would have had um, a binding group that would have a rather extreme moral position. And um, so it might be, I, I don't know. Um, that the group identification towards such extreme social groups then would be much lower. Um, so that they are still rather on the um, yeah, on the harmless side, the social groups and the differences that we have between those social groups. That would be my intuition. But, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if it came through, uh, you know, clearly or, you know, if I did a good job to explaining this, but when we explain to them who uh, these when we explain to them who these group, where this group A is coming from, we actually, oh, man, sorry, we actually tell them, you can see it here. Among other things, the study included questionnaire, you can see the answers of group A to a small select. In each case, the answer is the rating that is closest to the average that we received from the group. So there, we're not, you know, you could have picked one person and said, okay, you know, here's their answer, but uh, instead we use the average. And so that might be why you have a slight, you know, why, why they're still kind of saying, okay, I sort of connected, I 
sort of share some things with them. Yeah, I, that's actually my intuition too. I mentioned to Alex uh, in my 2019 contagion paper, that's the reason why I chose proximity to individuals and not groups, right? Uh -huh. So there I use sort of dating website questions. And then I tell people, hey, you have, you know, you answered many of the dating website questions in the same way or a different way, but then it's always towards one person. I was a little bit afraid that averaging out over groups might mute some effects, but so that's why the question came sort of from that, yeah. from that uh, space. Um, but yeah, great. Thanks for answering that. Um, I saw, so Don, Don, you, you pose a question. Maybe you can clarify if you want to unmute yourself what you meant with, um, you know, you might see a different effect for, uh, related to what results specifically. Thanks, Susan. Let me, let me widen the frame of the question a little bit. I just fired a kind of quick indicator version there. I mean, uh, it's, I, I understand why in one sense it doesn't matter to your main study whether your subjects who were, were individualizers or whether they were binders, because what matters is just the difference between <laughs> the response to the group they identify with and the versus the behavior of the group they don't identify with. But then I I wasn't surprised when it turned out that you needed the authority control. <laughs> because one would think, right? This, I mean, one, one thing that's interestingly different about your norm sensitivity check procedure from Kimmerow and Vostrotnikov's is in the KV version, their arbitrary task is sort of modeled on a, re it, it's, it's modeled on a real life task right, where everybody thinks it's normative to stop on red lights right. and go on green. Whereas your balls thing is truly arbitrary, right? This is just it literally, it's a rule because somebody said so. Um, well, one would think that, um, the, that the personality of a binder may be more accept more accepting, more happy to accept than a norm can arise in that way. Someone just decreed the rule, whereas mm -hmm. individualizers may be resistant to the idea that that anything can acquire normative status that way. Right? They might think, no, a real norm's got to evolve in a real social context. It can't just be somebody handing it down from heaven. And so. Uh, so you might see a very different effect, I thought, therefore, from your in your um, authority control, if your subjects are binders rather than individualizers. Mm, and then the obvious yeah. thing to do is just run the experiment again, where you choose a bunch of binders instead of a bunch of individualizers. And that is a happens. really, really good point. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Great, um, Christina, I see your hand up. You muted, Christina. Sorry, if you want to mute yourself. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I had a very similar question to Don. First of all, uh, um, Eugen, you say, you know, you look at individual versus group proximity. But I think Erin did a very important thing. Moral group proximity is a crucial form of group proximity. Okay? And uh, much more important uh, than other type of proximity. Okay, that's what divides us basically in political groups, ideological groups, et cetera, is basically the form of moral proximity. So I think it's a, it's a very good idea, it's very important. The thing on authority, that's what came to my mind as I said that. Okay, if a subject is a binder, it looks like a more authoritarian person. Uh, more the kind of person who says, uh, okay, the rule of the dog and, you know, is a decreed rule. That's it. I follow it. Okay. And an identifier looks like a more independently thinking person and say, this is a stupid rule. I may go for something else or whatever. And uh, so I think that the authority question really matters. Uh, to uh, the group, uh, uh, the, to the two different groups. Uh, so I would, I would explain it exactly like that. I think it's very, very important. But I want to stress uh, that uh, the moral proximity is really a very important for the group identification. And especially uh, with the, you know, this political polarization and what's happening with Yana Proud, uh, who is here, 
uh, we had an experiment in which uh, we give people real data about inequality and uh, they changed their assessment, for example, of how many poor people there are around, but their, uh, let's say, political assessment about, you know, should there be more progressive taxation, should there be more welfare, do not change again, because uh, these are really and, uh, into their sort of moral ideas of how they will be done. Great. So, so there was no specific question, I'm assuming, Erin. I don't know if you have any um, any response to to Christina's no, take on, on this one. Only to give only to give Alex lots of props for uh, come for thinking through this. As I said, he's the deep thinker on the project, and uh, Alex was really passionate about identifying, um, you know, things that uh, people really care about that are core, foundational, and. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I'm happy to talk more about kind of the um, methodological tools of the trade, if you will, for how we can investigate and explore these um, important trends. And, you know, as uh, earlier, for instance, Rachel Cranton in her groupie paper, there's a couple footnotes that I think are really useful talking about, you know, endogenous and exogenous group identity, right? So the endogenous groups are the ones that you you bring to the lab. They're here, they're baked into me. I bring them to the lab. How do we use those? Typically, methodologically, we prime so that we get, you know, group notions salient in our minds when we're trying to do something with them in an experiment. And then there's exogenous, where I assign you red or blue, you know, um, and these are based on the minimal group paradigm uh, approach that was, you know, first, I think, first presented by Shafir and then, you know, uh, expanded on um, and, and certainly adopted in experimental. And then Clay Kandinsky kind of comes out of that, this exogenous, uh, this, I would say that's the dominant paradigm anyway in the lab now for experimental economist is the Clay Kandinsky. Why? Because you really can't imagine that abstract blops of art, and I really do like Clay Kandinsky, don't get me wrong, but that those are in any way correlated with uh, the thing that I'm going to measure in the lab. But what I think is uh, here is really unique and exciting, just from a methodological perspective, which we never sell papers on or typically don't, but uh, is, you know, this a mechanism, which Alex really, um, really did all the heavy lifting on for how to think about um, and really use uh, things that are, are core to who we are and how we make choices, but still find ways to randomize to get that control in the lab to try and understand then how those impact choice. So I think that's really, really neat. Great. Yeah, I don't know if you you need any empirical validation of your claim um, that um, Klee Kandinsky is sort of orthogonal to the most things, but that's also one of the results in, in my Trump paper that you mentioned. So the, the Klee Kandinsky things are not correlated with the, with the political affiliation either. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that's great. So maybe, um, so we still have a little bit of time. Um, in, a, in your On your last slide, you, you sort of cut it short to open for Q&A, but I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on um, yeah. What do you think are sort of the next steps on uh, yeah. um, of these projects? Yeah, let me go here. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the I think you know uh, where uh, uh, well. Let me take a crack at it, and then Alex, if you have some thoughts too. Um, I think what's important here um, is, at least to me, is um, when we think about. Uh, Actually, it might be better to go back to this model. Let me just go back to the model for a second. So when we think about this model, um, which is, you know, a, a fairly, fairly um, structurally free model, except that, you know, we say it's additively separable. Okay. Um, this piece here, let me use the highlighter function. Um, this piece here, uh, whoopsie. This piece here, we're going to take as uh, exogenous. Okay, now um, one uh, just when we think about future pieces of work, I think the introductory um, the introductory slide deck from um, from the student. What was her name again? Let me get it right. What was her name, Eugene? Raquel. Raquel, uh, really trying to understand where this comes from. 
Okay. So, um, you know, in my work, we, I just, I just take it as given, but I think that's where Raquel's work is starting to really kind of add. I think of these as pieces that we're trying to nail down so that we can understand mechanism and in turn, you know, understand how to uh, influence or, or build, um, build properly, um, it, you know, norms and communities and things like that. So, uh, so what I would say is, um, you know, future types of work, I think just to highlight if, if you're out there and you're thinking, what can I pick up in this space? I think one of the places um, is both on the theoretical side, uh, what Raquel, for example, is trying to do, which is understand um, how and where norms come from and um, which ones are stable, which ones do we take as, as, as stable the way I have. Now, then there's the methodological side, which is, I think, also really, um, Eugene and I were talking about this a couple of days ago, you know, there's Christina's approach, which is to identify uh, individual beliefs about norms and then have folks play coordination game, trying to guess what the distribution of those individual beliefs are. And then there's the Roberto Weber, uh, the Weber, Krepke Weber, whatever, elicitation, which is just the coordination game, the second order sort of playing over second order beliefs. I want one thing that uh, Daniel Daniele Nocenzo et al's uh, recent set of papers have highlighted for me, which I'll just share as a cool insight, um, and we can talk here in this group too about, is that there are some really important times where um, in general, what's kind of emerging is that these two approaches to measuring these, okay, to grabbing empirical proxies, if you will, of the norm function, these two approaches um, generally yield similar results. However, you may prefer one approach over the other. Why? When? One example of when you might prefer one approach over the other is you might prefer Christina's approach when you believe there are very strong competing focal points, okay, that would impact the coordination game that Krupke Weber is using. So to me, this is like a really neat methodological advance um, for thinking about when one or the other might be a preferable approach, but both seem to be yielding very similar results so far um, in, the, in the research space. So I think um, moving forward, thinking about a general theory of where norms come from or what they are, um, on the methodological side, thinking about how we continue to identify them so that we can understand how they impact behavior. Then we've got the methodological advancement, which uh, Kimbrough and Vostratnikov started, at, or at least for me, gave me a tool for, which was how to measure concern for the weight, the weight on the norm. Everybody knows what the norm is. Some people care to comply, others don't. How do we capture this individual difference? So that's where they come in. And then, you know, what we've got, uh, but, you know, where this heterogeneity comes from, uh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know the answer to. Um, and then we've got this idea that this heterogeneity, one place where we might begin to understand uh, variations in why in some contexts I care and others I don't, might come from my perceived alignment with the group that I am being, um, being that I am part of. And I'll just say one more thing and then I'll stop. But if you go back to Taj and Turner, social identity theory, one thing that econs haven't really paid any attention to is when other people put you in groups. Now we've had lots of research around people who say, around me saying, I'm part of a group and it's really important to me. But we haven't had a lot of research of people saying, Aaron, you're part of a group. And me saying, well, I don't think so. And you saying, yes, you are. So for example, someone might say to me, Aaron, you're part of the white or the Caucasian group. And I would say, okay, but it's not really a key part of how I identify myself. And they say, well, but it is how we, the others see you. And so there hasn't been much work around that, um, which I think is a really interesting um, possible space to go into, which is the other side, the flip side. And finally, I'll say that another unexplored, but or there's some research on, uh, another thing besides moral alignment is status. And Christina and I were talking a little bit earlier about this, the relative status, the minority majority impact. So these are all areas open for research. And I think we've got lots of cool tools and emerging theories for each of these pieces now. So that's a little bit of uh, maybe a closing thought.
Great. So Aaron just gave a bunch of uh, PhD students a lot of great ideas on, on how to move forward with uh, lovely research. So maybe Christina wants to close out. Maybe you have a, some final thoughts, a final question. Just unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are so many issues here. <laughs> are we talking of norms in general or group norms? Okay, because we have very general norms, uh, but when we live and work in a group, we have also group norms. And these are, in a sense, two different animals because the group norm is something I want to abide by because as long as I am a member of the group, <laughs> I have to, even if my moral identification with the groups may be very weak. And actually, I use your Burke and Krupka article in my lectures when I do uh, uh, culture in uh, companies and culture is norms, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I know very well this work and I like it, but the question here is, are we talking of norms in general? And uh, norms in general, people tend to conform more if uh, they observe conformity from people similar to them. And then we have to check what similarity means in this respect, or are we thinking of group norms, which is in a sense a different story, okay? This is the first point. The sensitivity to a norm, again, sensitivity may mean in my, in my utility function, sensitivity is a parameter that you can measure, but basically is how much I care about what the norm stands for, okay? How much I care about fairness, how much I care about reciprocity. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And we are different in uh, the amount of, uh, you know, support we give uh, to what the norm stands for. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, if the norm is a group norm and not a general strong, let's call it moral norm. I don't like to call it. You know, I don't like to call it moral norm. But let's, you know, it's not fairness. It's not reciprocity, etc. Not cooperation. It is just a simple. Uh, group norm. What does it mean to be sensitive to the group norm? But usually I have to be sensitive because uh, I live in a group, I work with that group, and so sensitivity is almost a given, okay? So again, when we talk of sensitivity, what do we mean? We have to be more precise. And uh, last but not least, uh, what drives identification? Again, I work uh, uh, with my colleagues, uh, we are members of the center. There is a certain identification there. There are certain implicit rules. Uh, of course, I'm sensitive because you know we, we work together. We have to keep working together. The problem is, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, basically what drives uh, identification. And you said something interesting before or probably is Alex, your colleague who, who said that. He said fairness matters. And what I think you may want to do about uh, uh, identification, uh, ideas about fairness are very often what divides groups, what polarizes groups. And fairness is, uh, you know, about uh, not just how to treat other people in general, but fairness is about merit versus need versus equality. And uh, just, uh, I, I was just, uh, uh, you know, thinking, what about using fairness measures? Okay, if you want to think of general identification, okay, is fairness, uh, would fairness be a good measure more than all these measures of purity, authority, et cetera, et cetera, where we know that purity, authority, et cetera, are more identified more right-wing people versus left-wing people and so on. So but fairness, I think, is more interesting, is more subtle, and uh, would give probably very interesting results. But again, I urge you to think about sensitivity to what, what sort of norms, Okay, and uh, basically norms in general or very specific to groups. This makes all the difference. Yeah, I couldn't agree more.
that's a great, great, uh, great comment there. So uh, the the general, I, I think that's worth underlining for anyone listening is that there are, you know, this notions of general versus group specific um, and also uh, the, which ones pull or, uh, or, or inform your behavior. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, if later anybody wants to follow up with me on that or with Christina, um, we've definitely in a roundabout way, uh, come to a similar insight on a different paper looking at uh, rules that regulate identity expression. So, uh, you know, and basically, do you get to signal that you're part of a group or not? And that turns out to weaken or increase the relative force of group norms relative to the general norms. I'll leave it at that, but just to say, I think we're on the same path there in terms of though, as you put it, they're different animals. Yeah. <laughs> Great, so this was a perfect opportunity to uh, close out the, um, the fantastic talk. Aaron, thanks so much. Um, and um, Paulius, if you have any closing words. Um, I guess just to remind you that we will begin our talks again in September, you will get uh, the new lineup of speakers to your emails and it will be available in our webpage. And please remember we have our in person conference in October as well, the registrations and the final list of accepted speakers should be uploaded in the next couple of weeks. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Music